Good evening. Uh, turn with me to Nehemiah 13. Nehemiah 13, if you will. I'm not going to begin at verse 1. I'm going to look at 6. Okay? And then you'll find out right why. But in all this time, and this is Nehemiah talking, was not I at Jerusalem. You have to know he was not Jerusalem. For in the two and thirtieth year of the king of Babylon, actually Persia, came I unto the king, and after certain days obtained I leave of the king. You remember he came back to a report to the king of Persia. He was supposed to come back, and that he did after twelve years. We're going to get a little history of that. And after a time, he asked to go back. Uh, so let's just open in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for everything. We ask that you, again, just honor us with your presence. Lord, we want to know what you want us to understand. We want to know what you want us to see for ourselves. I ask right now that you come down and minister to each person and be with Kathy as she's teaching tonight. And Lord, we just need to be taught by your spirit as well. And I pray you open up this last chapter of Nehemiah to us. And I just praise you for all your blessings. And I say this in your name. Amen. You know, when it comes to Nehemiah, we have been looking at history, lots of history, considering the her heroic actions of a remnant and the qualities of a great leader. Uh, this is the last chapter of Nehemiah and the last in the series of a heroic series. But um, great leaders often turn out to be unassuming heroes. And they're not assuming a whole lot. They're, they're not looking for positions or fame. Rather, they desire to do the right thing. There's a story about a man during the French Revolution. He was uh, seen running down the street after a mob, <laughs> moving quickly to, towards danger. And somebody cried out, stop, don't follow the mob. While the man was still running, he yelled back, I have to follow them, I'm their leader. <laughs> now I want you to think about that for a minute, you know. I have to follow them, I'm their leader. All great leaders lead from the front. May I just say that? All great leaders lead from the front, knowing that they will become the target. And uh, any leader who refuses to lead from the front is not a leader. Now, he's a coward, but not a leader. He is willing to offer others up as a sacrifice for his agendas that really have no real significance to him because they're not important to him. He's not willing to stand up for what he believes what he think is right, and therefore he's not really a leader. What he is advocating is nothing of importance, and it makes him nothing but an empty despot at best. Now, the reality of it is, is that we uh, have had a leader like this in, in the United States. He prided himself from leading from behind, he would say. I'm leading from behind. No, he wasn't leading behind. Uh, the reality of it, he was more trying to fine-tune his golf game than to really lead. He was leaving wicked death parts to do his job and to take the flack or whatever was going on. And he was really a coward. And he actually let these wicked death parts run this nation into the ground. Because they were all wicked. Okay, let's face it. And of course, it caused such a reproach to us and such grieving to us. Now, great leaders, we're going to look at the qualifications of, of great leaders. But great leaders have, have convictions, okay, and they do believe. They lead because it's the right thing to do. Not because they're looking for something, okay. They lead because it's their destiny to do so. Now, once they get in that current of their destiny, they can't be anything but the person they were called to be. And this is the reality of who Nehemiah is. He was a great leader. 
a spiritual leader, a political leader, okay? He had a good life before he came to uh, Jerusalem. He was an unassuming cupbearer, but he found himself with a tremendous burden about Jerusalem. He found it a burden because the city was without walls and its gates burned, okay? And this burden is not a calling, people. Burden isn't a calling. Burden is something that you're supposed to get on your face and pray about, okay? A burden is to cause you to pray about it until God does something, okay? And so Nehemiah has this burden. He stands in the gap. He cries in, in prayer until the burden lifted. Well, guess what was at the end of the burden? His call. His call. And so if you have a burden today, you need to really say, Lord, I avail myself to stand the gap, to pray. And maybe at the end of that burden, you'll find your calling. But you won't know until that burden, you come to the end of it and see what God wants you to understand. You have to realize that he was being called to be part of the solution. You know, if there's a problem, we pray about the problem. But God may just call you to be part of the solution. Are you prepared? Are you ready? Have you been prepared in prayer for it? And so he became part of the solution to build the walls and replace the gates. Now, do you have a burden? Again, are you approaching the Lord in prayer about it? Okay. As I said, perhaps he wants you to be part of the solution. Perhaps at the end of it, you will find your calling. Now, the next aspect of leadership, it must always be, is prayer. Nehemiah was a man of prayer. Are you a person of prayer concerning what's going on around you? Not just about your problems, but about what God wants you to understand. About how to avail yourself to really minister to people. To carry out God's calling people it takes God's power and intervention. But that reality comes through prayer. That reality comes through prayer. And what I want you to know today is that the greater the dependency you have on God the greater the opportunity God has to show himself mighty through you. So the more dependency you develop for God, the greater he's going to show yourself, himself to you. And that's, that's something you have, have to realize because God cannot work through somebody that has all kinds of parts of agendas, selfish agendas and, and stones here of, of per, their own agendas or their own uh, preferences. He works through somebody who's totally open and dependent on him. God, what do you want me to do? And that's when he is able to move mightily through somebody. Now, such dependency, you have to remember, is always worked in us and worked out through prayer. You cannot forget that prayer. Now, the next thing that a great leader has is that a vision. In light of God's plan, it's his plan. It's been pointed out before, there is vision, there's revision, and supervision, but the greatest is vision, okay? I want you to uh, think about that for a minute. There are different reasons why people pursue a matter. I'll give you an example. of it. There was a story of a visitor who were watching men build a certain building, and he asked three of them the same question. Uh, he said... Um, what are you doing? Simple question, what are you doing? Now, as I read this story, I thought, this is pretty amazing to hear what their answers were. Was. One says, well, I'm working for a certain wage. Okay? I'm working for a certain wage. The second one says, well, I'm laying one stone on top of the other. Isn't that amazing? The third person he asked, he says, I'm building a cathedral. The last one had a vision. Okay? He saw the finished product. He was working towards the goal. Not working for something that's temporary, like a wage, or limited, like just building stones upon top of, putting stones on top of another stone, that's duty. He's working towards the finished product. And how many people have you met before who just are limited to, well, this is what I get out of it. This is what I benefit. I'm working for a wage. Or, well, this is my duty. 
and how many are enthusiastic about the end results because that's what they're working towards now that's a person again with vision okay vision produces work people that lines up to the ultimate goal if you don't have the goal in focus you, you're not your work isn't ever going to measure up to it please hear me your commitments never ever going to measure up to it because you have to become steadfast in reaching your goal and that's what a vision is that's why uh, Solomon says people without vision perish you can call it revelation you can call it whatever that is of course uh, if I remember right Proverbs 28 19 or something like that but it's true because I can tell you that the Lord has given me a certain vision of what he wants done and I have worked towards that and I haven't taken my eyes off of it because I knew if I did I'd never get it done and every vision has to be bigger than you if your vision is not bigger than you you don't have a vision all visions require something supernatural for it to be, be brought forth. It requires you to be steadfast. It requires you to keep your eye on the end results. Uh, Warren Wiersbe, Wir I can't say that, said, stated, there are no small churches and there are no big preachers in God's kingdom every job is a big job and every servant it's nothing apart from faith in the Lord bottom line that is basic truth so the next quality of a leader is you have to have the disposition to recognize and submit to authority that's the next one true authority okay real authority you have to recognize it uh, you can't lead people unless you know how to honestly and humbly submit to true authority you cannot truly lead if you have a fierce independence behind you you will never be a leader because you don't know how to submit to true leadership the job has to get done people not you come out on top the job has to get done to the leader the job has to get done it doesn't matter who gets the recognition I love what Ronald Reagan says you know it doesn't it you know it doesn't matter who gets the job done just so it gets done let's quit running over each other to try to be somebody and just do your job quit being fiercely independent and saying I'm doing it my way and I'm gonna give the impression I'm doing it everybody else's way that I'm submitting when in in fact you're raising up and, no I'm not gonna do it your way I'm gonna play your game up front but I'm not gonna do it your way those are people that will never be leaders they'll never be leaders they will isolate themselves and down the line they'll fall for everything but they'll never be leaders in the end because true leaders have to know how to submit to true authority to, un to come into order and under the right plan and when we're talking about authority of course we're talking about God's authority but God may use other people to say you need to do this no I'm not I'll just give you the impression you're not going to ever be a leader you cannot be entrusted with small things that's given to you by true leadership you will never be entrusted with great things that will require you to be a leader that's the bottom line of what goes on Nehemiah we saw was first submitted to the king's authority okay the simple reason for submission is that no one can exalt him or herself without being found to be a fraud and a fool all exaltation comes out from outside of you that's where exaltation has to come from if you're trying to exalt yourself you're a fool or a fraud and eventually you're going to be found out I love this, the parable of the people sitting at the table and there was one that insisted to sit up in front and the, basically the Lord says you go take a back seat 
And then some that were sitting in the back seat, he called forward. That's how it works, okay? You cannot exalt yourself. You try and people are going to look at you like an arrogant fool. So we see that, you know, he wasn't trying to be this great leader. He was a pliable servant before he became a great leader. Now the next uh, quality that we look at as far as leadership is that Nehemiah was able to organize what needed to be done. He was able to organize the work that needed to be done. If you are not good at organizing things, it's hard to uh, distribute the responsibilities, which is another quality of a great leader. They look at for talents, they look for abilities, they look at who can get the job done, and they put those people in the right positions. That's the other quality. It works hand in hand with being able to organize things. Now remember, he went out, he, he uh, surveyed the job that had to be done. And then he began to pick certain people to do certain jobs build certain portions of the gate, of the wall, or whatever. And so he planned it out. He mapped it out. He wasn't just chaos in what he was doing. He just, just didn't jump into it like a lot of people do, and then they can't figure out why no one's following them. He organized it, and he uh, was able to uh, appoint certain people to do certain things as a result. He enlisted these workers, and after it was finished, I love this, he topped it off with a revival service. <laughs> I love that part. It showed his spiritual leadership. But you know what? He always waited on the Lord before he moved ahead. He never got ahead of God. He waited to say, okay, God, what do you want me to understand? Uh, how do you want me to do it? Because he was a man of prayer. He got his walking orders from God. He got his instructions from God. He looked and sought wisdom from God. He had to for him to accomplish what he did because it wasn't him that accomplished it. Now, here's another quality. He discerned the different tactics of the enemy and he stood by faith. He was withstood by advancing forward and he continued to stand by being steadfast to the vision of his calling to the goal. We have to keep our eyes on the goal because we're going to get slammed by the enemies. He led by example, people. Good leaders lead by example. They never let the grass grow under their feet when there's a job to be done. They make sure it gets done. They see it through to the end. They have exemplary lives. I told you before, I read a book on uh, George Washington. His life was incredible. What he believed, he lived. And he was this example to others. Moral example. It wasn't just, you know, I'm this great leader. He was a moral leader. He had this example. He required the same moral standing out of his men. We have to live the, the example. And if we don't live the example, we can't be the leader. We can't preach and not walk. Because people are going to see us as the hypocrite we are. If we really believe it, we're going to walk it. We're not going to just talk the talk. We're going to walk the walk. And people are not going to be able to find the accusations against us. Remember... These enemies could not find accusation against Nehemiah. He never gave them any room to really accuse him of anything that was immoral or not right. We have to keep that in mind. His whole goal was one thing. And it's because his whole goal was one thing, his pride couldn't be tempted and his desire was always kept in check with the goal. And his goal was that all the work and results had to glorify God. That was his goal. There's many people who start out right, but they end up blowing it because it all of a sudden becomes about them being somebody 
Look at how great I am. Everybody look, look, look at me. And that's when they begin to lose sight of what's important and they blow it. Okay, and I've seen a lot of people blow it because they're seeking the glory instead of uh, bringing glory to God. Now, another quality he had, he had courage. You know, in spite of difficulties and the enemies, he stayed the course. Well, that's a big one. He stayed the course, and uh, basically, uh, you know, he continued on the path in spite of the challenging events that came his way, in spite of the threats that he heard, in spite of the accusations, he didn't go in there, oh, they're picking on me. He didn't go and cry in some corner. He kept to the course, okay? He kept to the course, and he kept the same focus no matter what. He didn't let the enemy take his focus. Now, people, when the enemy, what the enemy is is after is to get you off track so you don't finish what God's called you to finish. And you know what? I can't tell you how many people I have saw that I've witnessed never finish the course. And I just don't know why, you know, I'm not happy or satisfied or whatever. And that there's something wrong with my Christian life. And I thought, you've never finished any course. You give up. You throw up your hands. It doesn't serve your purpose. You don't want to do it that way. You don't feel like it. Look, it's nothing about feelings. It's nothing about whether you're, it's going to make you feel good. It's about glorifying God. It's about finishing the course. It's about doing the work he gave you. Now I sort of understand that. One of the things I realize is that the things that God has given me is to discipline me and to work character in me and bring godliness out in me. It wasn't just for nothing. But I've got to finish that course to see that product worked in my life, whatever he's doing. I have to trust him with it. God has never made any mistakes with the vision he's given me and what he's trying to produce in me because of it. As I said, he knew how to distribute the work. You know, there are some leaders who do it all. You met them. But they also burn out. And they also become very disillusioned and they find themselves alone because they're out there doing all the work to make sure it gets done the way they think it is instead of trust the Holy Spirit and other people to get the work done, okay? Uh, you've got to trust people to some extent as far as what God wants to do through them. So he did that, and as a result, they, they build that wall up in 52 days, right? Right? The other thing is, as a good leader, you, know, you need to know who are the true servants. You have to recognize the heart, the purpose, the calling. Uh, you know, uh, there's all these wannabes that come up to you and say, I don't want to do this. Well, you may give them a small responsibility. See if they really want to pay the price. And if they don't carry out that responsibility, then you know what you can give them and what you can trust them with, nothing. And so you begin to see how far people will carry out the burden or whatever, what they're good at. And I have to admit, some people will not go very far. Some, you know, you can use them in some areas, but you really can't use them with the most important aspects of ministry because they never see anything through on a personal level on any level and so you have to be aware of who you can trust and how far you can trust that's what a good leader is able to do right uh, a good leader can discern the talents and positions so they can rightfully place them in the right situation uh, and uh, allow them to prosper. You know, it's all about you putting people in the right position, not only to get something done, so that they can prosper, so that they can go forward, they can be blessed. 
Because when you're really serving God, you can be blessed, right? Now we come to this last chapter. Uh, because of the leadership qualities, as we're going to see, is, is going to be again tested in Nehemiah once again. But his desire to do right will always come to the forefront. Now, the great test for any leader is to always hold and maintain what I call the line of righteousness. It's not going to be popular when you do that. Because you're going to require people to do right, and they don't want to do right. And, but you have to maintain that line with yourself first. You have to maintain that line to assure discipline so that you can maintain it with other people. If you don't maintain the line of righteousness in your own life, you're not going to have any power, any authority to require others to hold their line of righteousness and whatever they do. This is something I love about Nehemiah is that he held the line of righteousness. Now, there's nothing that's going to test your patience more than the people who should know better, but treat Christianity as a sentimental matter and adjust it when it serves their purpose. You look at people and think you should get it. And all of a sudden, you realize they, they, don't, they may have got it, but they're not believing it or practicing it, okay? Uh, they're just letting down on the rope, as you would say, and they're a disappointment. I can tell you in ministry, if I really put my hope in people, I would be one disappointed person because there's very few people that see anything through. I'm not being critical. That's just the way they are. Very few people that will see anything through. Very few people that have the conviction, the steadfastness, the character to see anything through. And so that's why a lot of leaders said, I'll do it myself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and that's... That's pretty true. Now, individuals that are sentimental or emotional about their religious life, right? They can swing high as long as the sediment or the emotion is there, but there is no conviction or commitment to keep steady in what they're supposed to be doing. And so there's this waving back and forth. There's this you know, going back and forth, well, you know, and these people, what they'll do is they may know what's right, but they'll find an excuse why not to do it if it doesn't serve their purpose. And they'll justify it in the end. The, the problem with sentiment is that it will quickly wane and go out with the tides of convenience. And as such individuals I refer to as fickle. Very fickle people. Now, I started with verse 6 because it's important to note that Nehemiah had gone back and gave a report to the king as he promised after 12 years of being away. He went back. Then he came back to Jerusalem and they said perhaps it was as long as a year that he was away. Just a year, maybe. Maybe not even a year when he came back. And guess what? He was hit with some very familiar challenges. And the reason he was hit is because the ones he left in charge didn't hold the line. Can I just say that? They didn't hold the line of righteousness. So let's look at some of the things. Because it starts out with Moses, reading the book of Moses. Okay? Okay. But then you're going to see this swinging away from what's right. On that day, verse 1, they read in the book of Moses in the audience of the people. And therein, now remember, how many times did these people separate themselves from the pagan people? If you go back to chapter 10, 
What did they do? They separated themselves from the pagan people, and then they made a covenant. And 86 people signed the covenant. We're not going to give our daughters and our sons to marry these pagan people, right? Well, look at what's going on here. In the eyes of the people, and therein was found written that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever. Now, that's in Deuteronomy, by the way. I think it's 23, 3 and 4, where it says you can't come in, these, these pagans. Okay. And then it goes on, because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water, but hired Balaam against them, that he should curse them. Howbeit our God turned the curse into a blessing. Now it came to pass. Listen to this. When they had heard the law that they separated from their Israel all the mixed multitude. They had to go through the separation again. You think, do, what do you not get here? What do you not get? So there's this mixed group again that somehow has, has infiltrated the children of Israel again. What happened? Maybe they were never completely uh, separated. Okay? And that's, I think that's the case in some, in some ways. And so they had this mixed multitude again. Now this is a hard one that we're going to read now. And before this, Elisha the priest, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of our God, was allied unto Tobiah. Who's Tobiah? He's an Ammonite. And now this is what just shocked me. And he had prepared for him a great chamber where for a time they led the meat of offerings, the frankincense, and the vessels, and the tithes of the corn, the new wine, and the oil, which was commanded to be given to the Levites, and the singers, and the porter, porters, and the offerings of the priests. Where was this chamber located? In the temple area. And it was dedicated to take in the treasuries, the, the tithes and everything, to feed the Levites, the singers, and the porters. And instead of filling it, He's letting this pagan live in it. Now, who is this man? Do you know that he is the first man that was called to service to build the sheep's, the, the wall to the sheep's gate? He is a priest. His name is mentioned up front in chapter 3 of Nehemiah, verse 1. He helped build the wall as a priest. But now he's undermining the very law by what he's doing. You cannot begin to understand the reproach, the, 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 in, the significance behind this. So what we see is a manifest, manifestation of the Son of Holy Agreement between the priest and the Ammonite. Tobiah, who was an enemy of Nehemiah, who was an enemy of Israel's success, and this priest is in agreement with him, and he's actually letting him in the temple. That profanes the whole temple. Now, not only did this priest have a relative who was married to Sanballat, who was Sanballat? He was, a, he was also another pagan. Uh, he was married to this Sanballat's daughter, but Sanballat and Tobiah were friends. And so this priest had prepared in the temple for him to stay in, this chamber. Now, of course, this chamber was for dedicated and sanctified for other things. So to replace the designated chamber with a pagan infidel was the great reproach. <laughs> well, let me ask you something. How many chambers do you have that you've kept to yourself to maintain parts of the world? to maintain unholy relationships, 
to maintain certain rights? What parts have you kept back from God? I have to ask myself that question every once in a while. Warren uh, Wiersbe pointed out that it doesn't take long for the enemy to capture leadership. And too often the people will blindly follow their leaders in the path of compromise and disobedience. It doesn't take long. If Nehemiah was only away for maybe a year, it didn't take long. Okay? And he comes back to this mess. So what's he going to do about this mess? Because he thought he was leaving it in good hands. So look at it in verse 7. And I came to Jerusalem <laughs> and understood of the evil that Elisha did for Tobiah in preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And it grieved me sore. Therefore, I sat down and did nothing, right? No. Therefore, I cast forth all the household stuff <laughs> to buy it out of the chamber. Can you imagine this? He went in and he, I mean, he threw everything out. And so here's the stuff of Tobiah ready to meet him outside of that chamber. Can you imagine whether he was a little bit mad? I think he was very upset. And so he throws it out there. People, if there's something in your life that you're holding in for yourself, you need to clean it out. Quit hiding it. Purge whatever chamber you're holding for yourself or so you can have agreement with the world or something and just purge it. It is so much better than to have this unholy mixture that's going to cause confusion for you down the line and bring a reproach maybe on your testimony even. Let's look at 9. Now I love this. I want you to know after he got through throwing out to buy his stuff, he went in verse 9 and then he said, Then I commanded... And they cleansed the chambers, and thither brought I again the vessels of the house of God with the meat offering and the frankincense. So he told the Levites, go in there and purge that, clean that. And then he began to bring the things of God back into the chambers. Then, I love this, because you have to understand the important thing that this chamber was to keep the things that were to feed the Levites, the porters, and the singers. But it wasn't there for them. So look at what verse 10 says. You talk about an indictment. It says, And I perceive that the portions of the Levites had not been given them, for the Levites and the singers that did the work were fled every one to the field. Can you imagine that? They were forced back to the fields because they were not being taken care of. You have to remember the pre that the, the king even says, you will feed the singers. They were even breaking the, pre, the king's law here at this point, this priest was. But look at what he was depriving the true servants of God from. And he forced them back into the fields. Now, to me, this was a great reproach. It was a great reproach. It was an absolute disgrace. And it falls all at the feet of this priest. He had a lot to answer for. A man that should have known better. Now, 11. Now, I love this part, too, because he's not through. Then I contended with the rulers. <laughs> now once he left in charge, you know what he did? He called them to accountability. He says, why is it the house of God forsaken? How could you let the house of God be forsaken? Sometimes I wonder if the Apostle Paul was here today. How many 
pastors he would go through to and say, how could you allow the congregation of the Lord to be forsaken? What an indictment. And then he says, and I gathered them together. He had them together. And I set them in their place. Now he's holding them accountable. You know what's wrong with a lot of leaderships in our churches? They're not being held accountable. And they're not being held to the standard that God has called them to. And those who would be responsible, they're not allowed to take their place. They're put in the background because they're going to bring a standard back to the leadership they're not going to like. And they're going to demand you do it right. So I had a feeling those, uh, those uh, leaders were a little bit red-faced. Now, I want you to, to, to look at this in 12, 13. Then brought all Judah, the tithe of the corn and the new wine and the oil and tell the unto the treasuries. And I made treasures over the treasuries. And he gives their names. But I want you to look at the bottom of this because this is how, who he decided to give it to. For they were counted faithful and their office was to distribute unto their brethren. They were faithful men. That's why he entrusted them. Boy, to find faithful people <sighs> who can be overseers of the things of God. They're far and few and in between. I hate to say that. Because we don't see the conviction. We don't see the passion. We don't see the, see the set steadfastness of it. Okay? So... He put people over it so that that would never happen again, okay? Uh, the problem with leadership today is there's a problem, and they do not fill in the gaps, or they don't plug the holes. And Nehemiah is truly plugging the hole here. No priest is going to oversee this chamber. I'm going to put faithful men who's going to stand against any nonsense and make sure that that uh, chamber is used correctly. And then after he gets done doing this, he might have felt a little guilty. I wonder just how mad he was, just how in, in, in your face he was. He says, remember me, oh my God. <laughs> he cries out to God concerning this, and wipe not out my good deeds that I've done for the house of my God and for the officers, offices thereof. He says, remember God, I stood for you. Remember, I have called back the integrity to this place, your temple, to this chamber. And he says, just remember that. Now, remember the covenant, okay, in chapter 10. One of the part of the covenant was to keep the Sabbath. Because during the Sabbath, instead of keeping it, they were letting all these merchants come in. And they were doing the business of the world. And so they all agreed that they needed to stop that, to close the gates, and to keep the Sabbath. He's gone less than a year, or maybe a year, and look what's happening. Verse 15. In those days saw I and Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath, and bringing in sheaves, and ladding well, to me, there are asses that carry all the burdens. All, as also wine, grapes, and figs, and all manner of burdens, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, and I testified against them in that day, which, wherein they sold vigils. Can you imagine that? Look at 16. There dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought fish, and all manner where, and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Dru Judah in Jerusalem. They're breaking the Sabbath. It's not even a year from where they say, oh, oh we're going to keep the Sabbath. And they're breaking it already. And he's seeing this nonsense. What happened to the covenant? 
What happened to the law? What are you doing here? Now, who does he call on the carpet? I want you to see this because to me it's interesting. 17. Then I contend with the nobles of Judah and said unto them, What evil thing is this that you do to profane the Sabbath day? So now he's, he's getting on the nobles. Here's the rulers now, the nobles. How could you do this? So how did he handle it? <laughs> did he sit back and wait for the nobles to do something? Look at this in 19. And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded <laughs> that the gate should be shut. And charged that they should not be open till after the Sabbath. And some of my servants set I at the gates that there should no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. Now I want you to notice how the merchants responded to this. Here they come with their wares and the gates closed. Oh, well, it has to be a mistake, right? So look at this 20. So the merchants and sellers of, of the kind of ware launch without Jerusalem once or twice. So they came at least twice, and both times the gates are shut. And then he finally gets tired of it. And I love 21. Then I testified against them. <laughs> he went out and preached to them, okay? And said unto them, Why lodge you about the wall? If you do so again, I love this, I will lay hands on you. From that time forth, came they no more on the Sabbath. <laughs> I don't know what he meant by laying hands, whether it was to beat them up or whether he was going to send something after them. I don't know, but he says, don't do it again. And they believed him. I believe him. Oh, I like that. Now, I want you to see what else he did. He didn't stop just there. And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should come and keep the gates. Now he's saying, Levites, you come and keep these gates. I can't trust the nobles. I can't trust other people. But I'm going to trust you to keep these gates for me, okay? In fact, you're going to set yourself apart to do that. You're going to keep the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. You need to be set apart so you can set that Sabbath day apart. Then I love this. Here comes his prayer. Oh, my God, <laughs> concerning this also. <laughs> and spare me according to the greatness of thy mercy. I think he was pretty, probably pretty tough with some of those guys, right? Now, I want you to see this. This is really amazing to me uh, how far this has gone. Because you think, how far has this gone? Let's look at verse 23, this unholy mixture in those days also I saw Jews that had married wives of Ashdod and Ammon and of Moab. Here's a big one. And their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. That really made him mad. You know what makes me mad? People coming in this country saying they want to be citizens and they don't learn my language. I say, you're full of it. If you want to be a citizen of this country, you learn the language, you assimilate into the culture, or go back to your own culture. Because I don't need your gods, I don't need your problems, I don't need your idols. We have enough in America. I don't need your garbage. I get really upset about that. And the fact that we spend thousands of dollars because our children don't know how to speak English. And we're trying to, in, I mean, we don't, we try to educate them. And there's this gap. And I get really disgusted. And these people say, oh, well, I want to be here. Yeah, you want to live off of the, uh, the system. You want to take advantage. But you don't want to be part of it. You have no business being here. Now, I'm not... I believe in people having a chance, but if they're not willing to step up to the plate 
and become responsible people and add to our nation. They have no business being here because no nation should be a freebie for anybody. Citizenship is a privilege and an honor. And if you don't like your country, fine. But you need to learn to be a citizen of this country if you want to be a citizen. I love the fact that one day when Jesus comes back, he's going to send all these people back to their country. If they don't like it, they need to solve the problem and not become a problem to other people because that's just plain wrong. And I've seen it too much. And I know Carrie in school has seen it too much. She's seen what a drag it is on our kids because there's other kids that are trying to bring up because they don't know how to speak English or they don't understand the culture or whatever. And it is, it is a tragedy out there. How mad do you think Mr. Nehemiah was at this? I'm going to show you how mad he was. He's in verse 25. And I contended with them. Now look at this. And curse them. <laughs> He was not a happy camper. And he smote certain of them. He actually hit them, okay? And he plucked off their hair. Now you think he was taking this like I need to be diverse. Okay? And he made them swear by God, <laughs> saying, You shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons or for yourselves. Wow, there must have been some punching going on. <laughs> there must have been some words. There must have been some things going on. I mean, this is how I write he was over this. Okay. Then he goes on to say to them in 26, Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him, and who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause the sin. Wow. He says, look at what these people are doing, causing you to sin. Shall we then hearken unto you to do all this great evil, to transgress against our God in marrying strange wives? He says, shall we hearken to you? Shall we turn and look the other way? Should we forget it? After we have the example of King Solomon. Now, he's not done here. Okay? He's not done here. This is where we see uh, Eliashiv. Uh, relative, he said one of the sons, of course he was the son of the priest, the high priest, was son-in-law to Sam Ballot. What did he do with him? <laughs> Therefore I chased him from me. <laughs> I would have liked to have seen that picture. You know, you wonder if he had something in his hand chasing him out of there. Now the question is why would he have to? Because he had, he had to chase the priest's son away from him to silence the opposing rebellious voice among them. You do. Because as long as you let that voice stand there, it's going to say, it's okay, it's okay, because I'm in sin, I want to be in sin. He, he says, I'm not going to have your opposing voice, I'm chasing you out of here. You have no business being here. You've compromised, you've given in, you get out. So what did he do after that? Well, he caused quite a stir, didn't he? So he says, now look at what he says. He prays again. Remember them, oh my God, because they have defiled the priesthood, the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. Wow, remember them. Remember them in their sin. Remember them for their sin. Now we're going to look at the last two verses. Thus cleansed I them from all strangers and appointed the wards of the priests and the Levites, everyone in his business. He is starting to get the order back 
in the temple. He's cleansing it and he's getting the order back. And he says, for the word offering at times appointed and for the first fruits. And then he ends with this, remember me, oh my God, for good. That's a lot. We see an incredible leader, okay? Now it's clear that, the, that people constantly go backwards without strong leadership. People are weak. Because they are vulnerable, fickle sheep. I want you to realize, people, we are called to be great in the kingdom of God by being faithful servants, not vulnerable sheep. There's a day that we have to grow up. We have to take our place in God's kingdom. We have to be steadfast in our callings and in our lives before God. We have to hold the line for ourselves so that we can hold it with others, that line of righteousness. And Nehemiah shows us that. He's an incredible example to us. He took great failures and turn them around to make great successes. And so that's our challenge. That's what Nehemiah challenges us to do. He shows us all the pitfalls, and he shows us what we have to do to stand.